Church. Uh, we're located at 302 West K Street. My name is uh, Pastor Nathan Ogan, and um, this week's uh, message is from Genesis chapter 14, uh, and it's uh, the story of uh, Melchizedek. <clears throat> After God had called Abram to make a covenant agreement in Genesis chapter 12, a severe famine had broken out in Canaan so that Abram was compelled to move uh, along with his family to Egypt in order to uh, obtain food. Within a relatively short period of time, he returned to Canaan uh, to take up residence along with his nephew Lot uh, in the land that God had given them. As the story goes in Genesis chapter 13, the Lord's blessing upon Abram and Lot uh, his blessings were abundant, but despite that fact, their herdsmen were clashing, clashing with each other in the fields. So Abram took Lot onto a high mountain uh, precipice where he showed him the extensive lands and told him to choose where he and his family would like to settle. Lot chose the land along uh, the lush green plain east toward Zoar, leaving Abram with uh, the more arid uh, desert-like land west of the Jordan Valley. As we find out later, Lot, who is a righteous man, eventually discovers that not only is the land he's chosen lush with ample vegetation, but inhabited by a horribly immoral people as well. Beginning in uh, chapter 14, we're told that one of the kings of Canaan, named Keterlamer, had allied himself with three other Canaanite kings in order to attack the local provinces, capturing property along with nephew, uh, Abram's nephew Lot. In order to rescue his nephew, Abram pursues Keterlamer and defeats him in battle, taking the spoils of victory along with rescuing his nephew. On the way back to the land where Abram and his family had settled, he's bet, met by two more Canaanite kings. One was from Sodom, whose name were not told, and the other was from Salem, a kind of mysterious figure who is not only the king of Salem, but he's a priest named Melchizedek. This is where we catch up with him in chapter 4, verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Keterlamer and the kings, ally, kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm behind a slide here. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. This is one of those peculiar passages in Scripture where we have, here we have Abraham, later to be re renamed Abram, or excuse me, Abram, later to be renamed Abraham, returning from a major battle with his victorious plunder, faced with two kings from Canaan, one of which offers him a communion of sorts that includes bread and wine. In response to this curious gesture, Abram not only acknowledges the Gentile king, but even tithes a tenth of, a tenth of his possessions to the man known as the priest of Salem which, of course, is uh, the shorter form of Jerusalem. Now, the reader isn't given much information regarding the nature of this priest-king named Melchizedek other than what we've just read about here. We're just told that there was a meeting with this priest-king named Melchizedek that was obviously ordained by the God Most High. The question is, what are we to make of this? Now, before I attempt to answer this and other questions regarding this passage, let me just say that uh, my mind is humbled by what's presented here. So much is implied in, the, in this passage, and yet so little is provided in the way of actual background or content. We just have Abram encountering this strange priest king from Salem named Melchizedek, who obviously represents the biblical God in some form of mysterious but official capacity. Now, I'll do my best to sort out the biblical information provided for us, but you'll have to discern for your ju yourself just what the personal implications of this passage are. Let me point to three things about this passage, beginning with the fact that God protected Abram and his family. 
from the curse in Eden to the rainbow in Noah's story of the flood, God's protection of his people is always implied by his covenant that essentially says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Second, Abram embraced Melchizedek and gave him a tenth of his possessions. Despite the mysterious character of Melchizedek, Abram entrusted this man with his property and his life. And finally, Melchizedek blessed Abram in return for his victory over Caterlamer. Melchizedek's blessing invoked the name of the God Most High and celebrated, or excuse me, credited to him with Abram's victory over Caterlamer. As we said earlier, it was after Abram had arrived in God's promised land of Canaan in chapter 13 that he and his nephew Lot were compelled to divide the land because their herds and herdsmen couldn't seem to get along. Given the choice of territory by his uncle, Lot chose, of course, the Jordan Valley east of the river towards Zoar, a land that was filled with incredible greenery and vegetations and some of the most immoral people on the planet. Again, in Genesis 14, we're introduced to a king named Caterlamer from one of the more powerful kingdoms in the land. Caterlamer, along with three other Canaanite kings, sets out to seize and enslave the surrounding territories that included the land where Lot and his family had settled near Sodom. So Lot and his family, along with all their possessions, were seized by Caterlamer as spoils for war. Coming to verse 12 in Genesis 14, King, Ketalam, Ket, King Ketalamer <laughs> runs into trouble when Abram hears about his nephew and comes to his rescue. Now remember, God had promised to make Abram, exalted father, into a great nation, Abraham, father of many nations. And evidently, Ketalamer's conquests were interfering with God's plan. So Abram takes 318 men born in his household and pursues King Ketterlamer along with his allies and defeats them in order to rescue his nephew Lot. Though obviously outnumbered, Abram was successful in his mission and not only saves Lot, but Lot's family and all the stolen possessions that Ketterlamer had pilfered as well. Looking at this story, it's obviously impossible for such a small army of foreign men to defeat the likes of four pagan kings from Canaan. I mean, these guys were on the home field. But that's exactly what happened when God intervened. Abram and his 318 men not only defeated the four kings of Canaan, but caused them to retreat, re retreat says verse 15, as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. In other words, Abram chased his enemies all the way out of Canaan by the hand of the Lord God Most High. The fact is, if God would have allowed Abram to simply sneak into Caterlamer's camp and rescue his nephew Lot by night, that would have been sufficient to prove God's glory. But God took it a step further when he had Abram victoriously return with everything that was taken by these pagan uh, pilfering warriors, including his nephew Lot his family, and the spoils of five defeated kingdoms. You see, an important part of God's covenant with his people, specifically Abraham, was that he promised to protect us from our enemies, or he promises to protect us from our enemies. Of course, that doesn't mean that Abraham's or Abram's descendants, nor necessarily people of faith today, aren't subject to persecution and even killed for their faith, because we are more than ever before. It simply means that God provides for his people so that whether in this life or the next, we are victorious by faith in the God Most High. We're told in this short passage that after I'm sorry, I'm behind in my slides. <laughs> nice picture of a guy holding up a wall. Anyway, uh, we're told in this uh, short passage that after defeating King Ketalamer of Elam, Abram came out to meet the king of Sodom in the valley of Shava. Meanwhile, Melchizedek appears bringing bread and wine in verse 18 and is, and then is presented as both a, a priest of God Most High and the king of Salem. Now this is hundreds of years before Moses, the Ten Commandments and the Passover angel in Egypt. 
It's literally thousands of years before Jesus in the Last Supper in the upper room with his disciples. Yet this Melchizedek brings bread and wine to be shared in fellowship with one another, just as it would come to represent the communion of believers in both the Old and New Testaments. I can't begin to explain this, much less point out its full significance, but I can tell you that this is no ordinary communion. Turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 11. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? In other words, all people without exception are sinners, subject to the laws of condemnation, and thus were in need of a priest to mediate between us and God, not in the legal sense of Aaron's priest among the Old Testament Levites who stood between God and man, but in the priestly order of Melchizedek, whom Jesus represents in the New Testament. In Psalm 110, verse 4, David says prophetically, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Thus announcing the coming one who would be a priest forever, unlike the Levitical priests of Jesus' day. Thus the law of Moses gave way to grace. If the priesthood of, of Levi and Aaron, which provided the framework for giving the law, could really make people perfect, there wouldn't have been a need for a new priesthood like that of Melchizedek, says Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, in the message translation. But since it didn't get the job done, there was a change of priesthood, which brought with it a radical new kind of law. There is no way of understanding this in terms of the old Levitical priesthood, which is here which is why there is nothing in Jesus' family tree connecting him with that priestly line. But the Melchizedek story provides a perfect analogy. Jesus, a priest like Melchizedek, not by a genealogical descent, but by the sheer force of resurrection life. He lives, priest forever in the royal order of Melchizedek. The former way of doing things, a system of commandments that never worked out the way it was supposed to, was set aside. The law brought nothing to maturity. Another way, Jesus, a way that does work that brings us right into the presence of God, is put in its place. And I'm sorry, I'm a little bit behind on my slide. You can see there uh, on the screen this passage from uh, the Message Translation. I hope you'll pardon me, I have a, I have a head cold. Uh, cheap, uh, verses uh, 11 through 19 of Hebrews chapter 7. Now we may ask ourselves, what does all this mean? Some New Testament Jews had argued against Jesus that the law and the Levitical priesthood was adequate. You didn't need anything else. They didn't need Jesus. They didn't need a Messiah, really. I mean, a Messiah would be fine. Uh, it was predicted, but as far as Jesus is concerned, he certainly didn't fit the bill. That somehow, under the law, they said, God's system of justice and salvation was complete, as it was, or at least adequate without the likes of Jesus. But the author of Hebrews points out, using no less than Abram, the father of Judaism, to demonstrate that only Jesus could fulfill what the Psalms predicted and what Melchizedek had represented. And what Melchizedek represented was the fact that God's priesthood had been established long before Moses and the law, which were merely temporary symbols leading to the Savior Jesus Christ, not denying him. Look down in verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 7. The former regulation is set aside because it is weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant and now we begin to see that Melchizedek was embraced why Melchizedek was embraced by Abram because he came from God and played an important role in the prophecy that confirms beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord then Melchizedek, king, let me uh, switch the slide here. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. 
It was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Although this mysterious priest king named Melchizedek was probably a Canaanite and not a Jew, he already knew the God Most High even before meeting Abram. In other words, Abram may not have, he may have been called from Ur of the Chaldees, a pagan land, to come to the land that God had promised him in Canaan, which was also a pagan land, but he was not going to be without another believer in God Most, in the God Most High when he got there. After all, a pagan priest could never have meaningfully blessed Abram, consecrating the rescue of his nephew Lot and providing a tithe, unless he was a priest of the God Most High. By giving a tenth to Melchizedek, Abram affirms his agreement, you might call it a covenant, with what Melchizedek has said in blessing God. So is this unusual? You bet it is. But it's biblical as well. The fact is that Moses' legal system, which was still years and years to come in the future from Abram, would be inferior to the original covenant that it was supposed to uphold until the Messiah, Messiah arrived. The obsessive way in which the law was guarded in Jesus' day only proves that there are those who simply do not understand that God's love is founded upon grace and not the law. Yes, the law has served and it serves its purpose, but it, is never, it was never intended to replace the grace of God that was promised from the beginning of humanity. When the Bible speaks of the law, it's referring to a stand, the standard of expectations that God gave Moses in Exodus 20 called the Ten Commandments. This law explained God's requirements for a holy people who were separated from the evil around them in hopes that sinners would repent of their sin. What the law did was clearly demonstrate that no human being could purify him or herself enough to satisfy the law, revealing humanity's desperate need for a Savior. By the time of the New Testament, Jews, the Jewish religious leaders had hijacked that law and added to it their own rules and regulations. So while the law itself was good and intended to lead people to repentance, it had become diluted with human laws that lacked the power to change sinful hearts. Thus, keeping the law as interpreted by the Pharisees had become an oppressive burden. Into this legalistic climate, Jesus comes along and openly conflicts with the religious lawyers of his day. For the law was given through Moses, says John chapter 1, verse 17, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In order to accomplish this, Jesus had to be a priest superior to those in the Old Testament who represented the law, and thus Jesus was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So what are we to think about this mysterious Old Testament character named Melchizedek? We know that he was an important part of God's covenant plan to protect his chosen people through Abram. We know that he was embraced by the biblical patriarch Abram, who shared with him both bread and wine. And we know that it was Melchizedek who blessed Abram, and not Abram who blessed Melchizedek. So it would seem as though we've come to a place in Scripture that almost exceeds the biblical boundaries of our grasp. We've come to a character similar to Jethro in Exodus 18, who was also a priest that worshipped God like Moses did, and yet, like Melchizedek, he was a Gentile. Evidently, God has always called out a people for his namesake from among the Gentiles as well as the Jews, even though Scripture rarely stops to explain this phenomenon. What we learn from this passage is that it's what we don't know about Melchizedek that's just as important <clears throat> excuse me, as what we do know. Our logical minds are, by this passage, are forced to embrace an inverted logic of sorts where what we don't know informs us about what we can know. Listen to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. 
He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. If this description of Melchizedek sounds awfully close to that of Christ, then you're beginning to understand what Genesis 4, 14 rather, is all about. Jesus is no biblical afterthought of, God, of a God whom the apostles invented to fulfill in the New Testament, with uh, to fill in the New Testament with hope based upon Old Testament promises. No, Jesus is every bit that same mysterious figure intertwined in Abram's life, who is both Lord and Savior, King and Priest, God. That concludes our sermon. If we can be of any further help to you or your family, please contact us at cpclosmanos.com. Uh, you can also email us, uh, contact us any way you'd like. Uh, we meet uh, at 1030 on Sunday mornings. Um, we're open for service, uh, and we hope that uh, you'll consider joining us uh, if you're not already attending a church elsewhere. Thank you very much. God bless you, and God bless... Calvary Baptist Church.